Can a lover go but to the land of his beloved? And what seeker findeth rest away from his heart's desire? See if I come back to where I left off. Yeah, we uh, we left off the story of Mirza Haidar Ali when he, at one point, and I, I don't know the year, but of course, all this is in the time of Baha'u'llah, when he was about to go to Adrianople uh, on a pilgrimage to visit. And uh, I told you the story. Uh, of uh, someone by the name of Mirza Muhammad Ali Kad Khuda. Um, so anyway, this is a story of, uh, I think I mentioned that, that uh, they were like they were admiring Baha'u'llah's writings and who, uh, uh, the Bab's writings and who the Bab was. And they were saying that he was just perfect and that nobody could even write like him or would ever dare pick up his pen. And the problem was that with the Bab, unfortunately he said that the Bab, the Bab didn't study under anybody of any, any of these wise, learned uh, uh, Muslim, you know, uh, wonderful imams or, or leaders. Otherwise, he was was okay. But anyway, that was his, his problem. Anyway, so so then he continues because he was on his way to Adrianople, and he uh, well, this, is, uh, this is our, our suffering with our dogs here. So in Zanjan one of the cities in Iran, he met uh, Abba Basir and uh, Sayyid Ashraf and Mullah Ibrahim. Anyway, so Mullah Ibrahim was from a village near Isfahan. And this simple hearted and innocent man had suffered so much in his own village that he was forced to forsake his home and his friends and relatives and seek refuge and shelter in this far off district of Iran. So again, this is the period of basically harassment and persecution. You know, I guess hopefully Baha'is of today will not go through this, but you know, anything can happen, of course. It happened then. So before he left his village, he had been in prison. As was the case in those days, the jailer constantly demanded bribes the prisoners in exchange for providing them with uh, the barest essentials of life. And uh, so Mullah Hussein told the jailers that he had no money, but was willing to work. So he earned his frugal living as a laborer in the prison. After he was released from prison, he went to his village to gather a little money from the sale of his house and property. But he learned that uh, his relatives had taken everything. This sounds very much like what happens in Africa here, you know, when you disappear or divorce or whatever, they, the relatives are waiting and they just take stuff, they, they, they don't care. So anyway, he lost everything. So in order to find shelter and security, he left home, village and relatives for a distant province in the north. So his joy was to work, earn a little money, spend very little on himself, and give the rest to the poor. He agreed to go with me on pilgrimage to Adrianople and promised to meet me in Tabriz. On his way there, two men clad as dervishes joined him pretending to be believers on their way to Adrianople. They won his confidence. Uh, then they stole what little money he had and ran away. So he reached Tabriz empty handed but determined to go on with me despite his misfortune. And now 
On my way to Adrianople, many thoughts passed through my mind. In my childhood, I had learned a tradition about how a man shall meet his Lord on the day of judgment. According to this tradition, those who are honored with meeting their Lord on this day will find themselves intoxicated with the wine of paradise and will experience such joy as is beyond description. I knew that the true meaning of this tradition was to attain the presence of the manifestation of God and that such a meeting would be as heaven on earth. I was fond of this tradition and by the grace of God, I was permitted to discover for myself that it was true. I had also had a conversation with Haji Sayyid Javad al Karbilai. This great man had the honor of meeting and studying with Sheikh Ahmad and Sheikh Kazim Rashdi. He became one of the early believers in the Bab and he embraced the faith of Baha'u'llah and lived near him during the Baghdad period. The Bab appointed him one of the mirrors of the dispensation of the Bayan. A follower of Azal once asked Sayyid Javad in the presence of others to describe the countenance of the Bab. He immediately said he was unsurpassed in beauty and sweetness. Have you heard of the beauty of Joseph? This is what I mean. Fearing that his answer might be taken to mean that he was a follower of Azal, I asked him about Baha'u'llah. And he immediately replied, know with certainty that if anyone, friend or enemy, claims to have looked directly into his eyes, he is a liar. I tested this again and again, but all my attempts to look at him were in vain. Sometimes the friends were so carried away in his presence that in their bewilderment, they would forget the world within and without. Can one fix one's gaze upon the sun? During the seven months I stayed in Adrianople, I came to realize what those words of Haji Sayyid Javad meant. 15 years later, after that, I went to Akka to visit Baha'u'llah. And he's jumping uh, 15 years later. Often I desired to know what color of Taj he wore, and yet I forgot to think of it every time. I was in his presence. One day he was having his midday meal in a small room at the garden of Rizwan. Some of the friends were inside while others were standing in rows outside. From behind the crowd of believers, at last I could glimpse the marvelous Taj on his head. Its color was green. What happened in my soul and heart while I was with him was an inner and mysterious experience beyond the scope of my words to describe. One of the mullahs of his heart once asked me, what did you see when you were in his presence? I said, I had expected to see all sorts of miracles. I also had several questions that I wanted to ask, but when I attained his presence, all this became unimportant. I had found the pure water with quenches, which quenches thirst and gives true life. The mullah asked, what did you see? I saw the form of a human being, I replied, but his every step and movement was like a miracle to me. I saw him and my eyes could take in nothing else for he is different from all others in his bearing and in his manner. He is unique by himself. No one in the world can ever be compared to him. He is the one whom the Quran has declared to have neither father nor son. But Baha'u'llah's father was well known, the man replied, and his son, Abbas Effendi, is renowned for his perfections. I saw neither father nor son, was my response. Baha'u'llah alone is the source of God's revelation. He is the one who begetteth not, nor is begotten. If you stand before a mirror and speak your name, your image will do likewise, but it is an illusion. The clergyman was pleased with my answer and asked me more about the faith. One of the most famous merchants of Qazvin was Haji Muhammad Bakir. Not only was he well known as a merchant, but he was also prominent in his service to the cause, a service which was, which was much appreciated by all the believers. 
Once he sent a letter to Baha'u'llah asking him to bestow upon him the bounty of wealth so that he could serve the cause with greater capacity. Baha'u'llah answered that the doors of wealth would be open to him from all sides, but he must be ever vigilant lest material prosperity become veil between him and his creator. And you probably all know this story. Baha'u'llah also said to those in his presence at the time that Muhammad Bakir would soon be drowned in wealth, but material success would close his eyes to the realities of life to such a degree that he would turn his back on the cause and even deny God. But he would suffer the tremendous losses and would return to his Lord in repentance. Because of his repentance, God would change his losses into ample profits to such an extent as to enable him to become the leading merchant in Tabriz and Constantinople. This time he would become even more proud and would again ignore the faith. And then his wealth would be gone forever. He would no longer be able to trade and would become helpless. He would then return in repentance once more and remain poor but content. In this state, he would serve the cause and achieve great success in his service to God at the end of his wondrous and ominous statement, Baha'u'llah addressed me and advised that I should remember all the events as they unfolded. So after some time, Muhammad Bakir's brother was arrested and thrown into prison because of his faith. Muhammad Bakir paid a large sum of money to obtain his brother's release. After that, Muhammad Bakir made his way to Constantinople upon his arrival he recanted his faith and approached the court of the Sultan and the Persian ambassador, begging them to consider him a true Muslim. Baha'u'llah immediately remarked that this was the starting point of the chain of events he had described before. I then went to Constantinople, where I stayed 14 months. There I learned that Muhammad Bakir had purchased great quantities of cotton, all of a sudden, the price of cotton dropped so low that our friend lost his wealth and became submerged in debt. In his deplorable condition, he again remembered his Lord and wrote a letter to Baha'u'llah in which he repented and begged him to come to his aid. Baha'u'llah replied, assuring him that he would regain his wealth. When I was in Egypt, I learned the price of cotton had risen sharply Muhammad Bakir's wealth grew to 10 times more than ever before. Although he had been tested once, he fell a second time into the trap of greed and failed to know his Lord and provider. Baha'u'llah wrote him again and alerted him to the danger of material temptation. He exhorted him to remain steadfast in the path of God and grateful for his bounties. But once more, Muhammad Bakir ignored God and remained heedless. When after many years, I found him again in Tabriz, he told me, after I received the tablet, it seemed to me that even the nails and curtains on the walls of my room had ears to hearken and obey. One by one, all my possessions slipped quietly from me. I was reduced to poverty and was forced to leave Constantinople for Tabriz, where I live in this house, which belongs to my wife and wear clothes that are made by my children. Azal wrote a letter to the governor of Adrianople complaining about Baha'u'llah. He had no aim in doing so except to heap calumny on Baha'u'llah and attempt to place him in an untenable position. The governor who knew Baha'u'llah took Azaz's letters to his house and sought his instructions. The ancient beauty replied, ask him to come and see me. If he comes, then whatever he says is right. The governor asked Azar to go to the house where he could meet Baha'u'llah. To this simple request, Azar answered, we do not go to each other's houses and he will not come to the governor's house. Eventually, the great mosque of Sultan Salim was chosen as the meeting place for Baha'u'llah and Azal. On a Friday morning, Baha'u'llah started out for the mosque. The people, anticipating his approach, thronged the way between his house and the mosque. All stood in reverence and awe to receive his blessing. 
hoping for even a glimpse of him. The street was so full of people that all other travel was stopped. The people in the crowd spontaneously raised their voices in salutation and praise. They tried to approach him and some prostrated themselves in his path, hoping to kiss his feet with great joy and respect for Baha'u'llah. They elbowed one another and made way for him to pass through. In response to all these reverent salutations, Baha'u'llah raised his hand again and again and pronounced words of greeting. Marhaba, marhaba, barakullah fikum. Greetings, greetings. May God bless you all. As soon as he entered the mosque, the preacher who was addressing the immense congregation from the, his high pulpit stopped the sermon and fell silent, either by choice or because he forgot what he had to say. Baha'u'llah took his seat and asked the man to continue. Time passed and everyone expected Azar to arrive also, but to their great surprise, he never appeared. There are dervishes who gather together usually on Friday mornings to sing the poems of the Masnavi and to mention the names of God, repeating, he is God, oh God, to the rest of this chant and the sound of music and drums, the worshipers sing and sing, dance and dance, world and world, gradually increasing their speed until they become intoxicated with the mention of God and are attracted to him and his greatness and majesty. On that Friday morning, when Baha'u'llah left the mosque to return to his house, he heard the dervishes singing and he said to his companions, Maulana needs a visit from us. The governor, his officials, and the notables of the town, finding this a great and unique opportunity, followed Baha'u'llah. The mayor, Sheikh al-Islam, and the ulama kept a distance of at least five paces behind him. Everyone Every now and then Baha'u'llah would stop and ask them to approach, but they remained where they were, saluting him in the fashion by placing their hands on their chest and bowing their heads and utter respect and reverence. In this order, they followed Baha'u'llah into the taqi, as the place where the dervishes congregate to, to sing and to dance and to whirl. Jack? Jack? Yes, yes. Are we currently still in Baghdad or are we now in Turkey? Because the dervishes make me think that we're in Turkey, but you know he jumps around in time, so I'm not sure when we are now. Is it still right after when he saw Baha'u'llah in the Garden of Rizban and he said he is like no other? No, no, no. no. Okay, I this apologize. A, I just you know he's not really good with time, so. No, no. So the beginning of this was Azal wrote a letter to the governor of Adrianople. Okay, all right. About so we're okay. in Adrianople. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. I apologize for interrupting. No, no, no. Interrupt any time. So, so Baha'u'llah followed them into their, this, the, the, the place where they meet. The dervishes were in the midst of their shouting and rapid whirling, and the music was louder than ever. But when Baha'u'llah entered the taqi, the proceedings came to a stop, and all fell absolutely silent. Baha'u'llah sat down and very graciously motioned to his companions to take a seat where they could, then he allowed the dervishes to resume their activities. That night, or the night after that memorable day, I had the honor of being in his presence. Baha'u'llah said that when he entered the mosque, the preacher forgot his sermon. And when he entered the taqi, the dervishes stopped awestruck and were unable to continue singing and whirling. As the people of the world are brought up and trained in vain imaginings, they take such events as miracles. But God and his prophets are in realms beyond man's reach and comprehension. In Adrianople, as well as in the Holy Land, I heard him tell us about the events of his own life. He often remarked that should the people ponder the life of the Bab, his captivity, imprisonment, and martyrdom, and his writings, they would surely realize that what a gift he gave to the world, that throughout such an eventful life, the hand of God remained forever far above the understanding and reach of man. Pondering his life, captivity, and exiles, one would surely come to realize that enemies of the faith, their rulers, potentates, and kings, despite their well-equipped soldiers, 
well-organized plans and cunning stratagems were invariably turned into an army which caused the progress, proclamation, and solidarity of the faith of God. In the early days of the faith in Isfahan, now we're back in Isfahan, when I first became acquainted with the beautiful writings of the Bab, I was captured by their power and majesty. The words were like a string of pearls. The proofs and arguments of the friends were so overwhelming that I felt no one could ever deny their truth. But when I was alone, I would become the target of suspicious, vain imaginings and evil whisperings. All that I had read and learned previously would then come before me. The purgatory implied in all the books of God surrounded me. The, to overcome this terrible period of testing was indeed difficult. Only God knows of my anguish and the many hours I wept. I passed many a sleepless night when rest and comfort abandoned me. Some days I concentrated so much on my own spiritual dilemma that I forgot to eat. Many a time I pushed away all evil, all evil thoughts and became a firm believer. But with the slightest negative thought, I would once again retreat and almost deny my newfound belief. Then one night, I dreamt that a town crier appeared in the bazaar of Isfahan, announcing the advent of the Prophet Muhammad and proclaiming that whoever wished to meet him could go to a certain house and attain his presence. He said that the glimpse of his countenance was even more worthy than service in this world and the world to come. On hearing this, I hastened to the house where the Prophet Muhammad was said to be. And having entered, I prostrated myself at his feet. He lifted me up with the utmost love, and then he addressed me saying, one may claim that he has come here only for the sake of God and has attained the presence of his Lord only when he has stood firm against the world of enemies who have drawn the swords against him because he has embraced the cause. Otherwise, he cannot say that his motive was to find God. I awoke and found myself in a state of joy and certitude. At that moment, I came to understand the mystery of suffering and the reason why the followers of all the prophets have suffered. I rebuked myself time and again and said, I had read all those heavenly utterances of the Bab, yet I had to reach the state of belief and certitude through a dream. 14 years later, I found myself in Adrianople, where I stayed for about seven months. One night, when I was in the tea room with Akha Muhammad Kuli, I felt a longing to be in the presence of Baha'u'llah, even for a short while. I had not the courage to ask for such an audience since it was very late. Suddenly, Abdul Baha opened the door and asked me to follow him. Having left the room, I found Baha'u'llah walking on the roofed area of the house. Some of the friends were standing and listening to his utterances. Then I was admitted to the presence of the ancient beauty. I prostrated myself at his feet. He picked me up with love and gentleness and said, one may claim that he has come here only for the sake of God and has attained the presence of his Lord only when he has stood firm against the world of enemies who have drawn nigh, who have drawn their swords against him because he has embraced his cause. As I write this, I have not the slightest intention of relating a miracle, but only to wish to state the facts as they occurred. We cannot comprehend such confirmations from the chosen ones of God. The faculty of man's understanding may be likened to a man who is lame or paralyzed, while the minds of the prophets of God move as swiftly as lightning throughout the firmament. How could these two forces ever come together? That evening, there was talk of my leaving Adrianople. Baha'u'llah sent a message to find out about my plans whether I desire to stay or depart, and if the latter, 
when and to where, I hastened to the beloved master, Abdul Baha, and begged him, please do not abandon me to myself. Do not ask me about my desire, plan, will. Let his will be done. Let him order me to go to, and confirm me to do whatever he desires. I am homeless of simple needs and have no one who depends upon me. My plea was accepted and his instructions were conveyed to me that I should take up residence in Constantinople with the responsibility of the received tablets and letters and dispatch them to their, to their destination. And also to help the friends on their way to and from pilgrimage to in Adrianople. My companion in Constantinople was Mirza Hussein and my joy in consolation was to have in my possession the tablets I had brought in the, hand, in the handwriting of the master and Mirza Musta. What a joyful time was ours. We had the honor of meeting the believers, receiving tablets, dispatching them regularly to the friends and preparing those things which were required for the household in Adrianople. I also had an opportunity to meet the pilgrims on their way to Adrianople. They had, they had to remain a few days in Constantinople, making preparations for their journey or seeking permission from Baha'u'llah to pilgrimage. They also stayed a few days on their way back. Jinnabe Kalim used to write regularly and keep us in touch with the glorious tidings from the presence of Baha'u'llah. And Akha Muhammad Ali would write concerning the purchase of things required for the house in Adrianople. Once he ordered some tea, I purchased some tea and sent it, but he was not satisfied with his quality and wrote me a very gentle letter pointing out that I should pay more attention because such goods were to be used by the Holy Family. Being young, haughty and proud, I took offense at this small piece of kindly advice. In a state of bitterness, I wrote an answer which was not courteous and indeed not even worthy of a believer. A little time passed and I received a tablet from Baha'u'llah, assuring me that all my services had been graciously accepted and expressing his approval and pleasure. When I read this tablet, I realized that the letter had, I had written had been a grave mistake. I, having lived seven months in his presence, I had come to know that this supreme manifestation of God chastises the souls of sinners to the scourge of love and compassion for their own edification. He conceals our mistakes and forgives us so that the wrongdoers will receive divine education. In addition to that, his forgiving and merciful attitude to the people shows them by example, the rights, the right path to tolerance and servitude. When through his bountiful attitude, I was awakened and came to realize what an impolite letter I had written to one of the servants of the household, I turned to God, wept and prayed fervently for forgiveness. I was in a deep state of distress and dismay. Again, I turned to Abdul Baha for help. I implored the master to intervene and ask forgiveness for me. Then instructions came that I should go to Egypt. <laughs> it was going to happen to him now. I went to Egypt. This assured me that I had been honored with the garment of pardon and mercy before departing. I went to Adrianople and another pilgrimage during the last month, moment of my audience. To Baha'u'llah, he assured me that I would attain his presence again. So he knew that he, he was not going to die wherever he went. Before I reached the continent of Africa, see, that's where we are living now. The Persians in Constantinople had written to those in Egypt. Because there were Persians in Egypt, and this was all Turkish land, you know. Uh, warning them about the arrival of the Gabriel of the Babis. This made many of them hasten to my place of residence to behold such an unusual creature, a Babi. Some came in and inquired, why did you abandon Muhammad, the seal of the prophets? Why did you withdraw your hand from the hem of the garment of our innocent imams? Why did you exclude yourselves from the Muslim community? I was at a loss for what to say or do. I had been instructed to be cautious and even to remain unknown now, if I hid myself on my faith and did not utter a word in answer to these questions, they would accuse me of being a coward and or of being ashamed of my beliefs. I knew there would be no end to such questions. But I felt that I needed to give some response so they would not consider the followers of the faith ignorant 
or unfaithful. Therefore, I answered them, we are not here to cause confusion or dissension. I said, will you not show some kindness and let us discuss things on the basis of mutual understanding and goodwill? Let us fix our sole aim on finding out the truth. All that you have said so far consists of accusations and slander against us and has no basis at all. We believe wholeheartedly that the Quran is the book of God, that obedience to its, com its compulsory and that his verses are a guide to the path of truth. It is in this book that we find the story in which a man from the family of Pharaoh, who was the believer and concealed his faith, said, Will ye slay a man because he saith, My Lord is God, when he hath already come to you with signs from his Lord, from your Lord? If he be a liar on him would be his lie, but if he be a man of truth, Part of what he threatened will fall upon you. In truth, God guided not him who is a transgressor, a liar. Surely you have heard of a certain notable from the lineage of the Prophet Muhammad. Though this Sayyid was saintly in every aspect of his life and guided the people to God and his prophets, he was severely persecuted, exiled, imprisoned, and finally put to death by a firing squad of many soldiers. You also have heard of thousands who followed his footstep to persecution and martyrdom. Those who quaffed the cup of suffering and ignominious death were not the ordinary people. They were among them the erudite, the chief clergy of the Islamic faith, philosophers, saints, mystic leaders, seers, and chieftains. Now the least that is incumbent upon the Muslims is to follow the example of that man from the family of Pharaoh and leave me in peace. They said, what shall we do? We said exactly what our religious leaders told us to say. They have even forbidden us to approach you, contact you, or talk to you. I told them, have you ever heard or read anywhere that the, when the prophet manifested himself, the clergy told him, you are welcome? The prophet Muhammad, Jesus Christ, Moses, and the other have been the targets of the most cruel accusations heaped upon them by the most learned of their names, the times. The Imam Hussein was put to death by a decree signed and sealed by the most prominent religious dignitaries of this, his era. As for me, I do not even consider myself as equal to that, the dust of the footsteps of the least of their lovers. I'm not here to teach. I do not think of myself as worthy of such an exalted position. The discussion proved at least to be a good introduction. For three days later, the people, for three days, the people remained hostile. But after that, they became friendly toward me. They even invited me into their houses. Haji Mirza Shabad Shirazi was one of them and considered by all to be the most notable and honored of the Persians, Persian merchants He's in Egypt. He had seen the Bab in Shiraz and was full of admiration and reverence for him. He often praised him by saying that the Bab was unsurpassed in beauty, spirituality, and courtesy. There was no one equal to him in nobility, accomplishments, and saintly qualities. He remained as one alone, unique in the age in which he lived. Another was Haji Muhammad Hassan al Kaziruni. He eventually embraced the faith, but did not reveal it to anyone. Haji Muhammad Rafia was also a well-known individual, famous for his truthfulness and laudable traits of character and manner. Haji Abdul Qasim Shirazi often used to come and meet me, but always in secret. The reason he gave for this was that he could not trust the friendship of his compatriots. But the time came when he could no longer hide his faith. He was 70 and became so ignited with the fire of certitude that he burned away all the veils separating him from his beloved. He was totally transformed. That is to say, his fear was changed into audacity. He had been alone, but now he brought his family from Shiraz. He manifested such praiseworthy traits of character that his friends were astonished. He often said, Wealth and riches are good, but only when they are spent in the path of the cause of God. Otherwise, they will cause misery and the loss of one's soul. He decided to go and behold the countenance of the ancient beauty, but he had to, to get traveling documents from the Persian ambassador in Constantinople. It was extremely difficult, especially when they discovered that the applicant's intention was to go to Adrianople. He had to pay the ambassador a large sum of money but he persevered and finally the difficulties were removed. When he returned from this pilgrimage, he was utterly a new creation. Now he was steadfast in the cause and could stand alone against the whole world. He was indeed like an unshakable mountain 
which had changed into a flowing river. His knowledge, love, and enthusiasm became exemplary. He could no longer remain silent. The stories of his pilgrimage were his favorite subject, and he always related them with the same joy and vigor. It is worthwhile pondering the fact that he was 70 years old, and his thoughts, manners, and customs were deeply ingrained. It is well known saying that when a man becomes old, two characteristics will be reinvigorated in him, greed and ambition. Yes, he became greedy, but to spend all that he had in the path of the propagation of the cause, he also grew young in his hopes and ambitions, but these ambitions were to be spread the word of God. The Persian consul this is in, in Egypt, advised many people to associate with me and even to pretend that they were believers. Hussein Hakkak and Mirza Tafa were among them. They would come to my room and to win my confidence, they would speak very highly of the faith. Mirza Safa claimed that he had seen the Bab in Bushir, where he had recognized in him the signs of the exalted station distant for him. Afterwards, I learned that these two had been special agents of the council sent to find out the names and addresses of all the believers in Egypt. The day approached when all Shia Muslims would commemorate the martyrdom of the Imam Hussein, Imam Ali. The consul invited me to come to his house on this especially holy night. He told me that all the Persians in the city would be busy that night with prayers and that he would send home the servants of his household. My house will be empty and we will be alone to discuss whatever we wish, he explained. A certain man who was an old friend of mine he used to meet me very often. He was a man of no religion and, as a matter of fact, was against all of the prophets. When I received the consul's invitation, he urged me not to accept, explaining that it was surely a device by which the consul could get me under his flag in his office and then arrest me and make me prisoner. If this happened, he explained, the Egyptian government would not be able to protect, to protest. Even if they came to my aid, the consul would level accusations against me and slander me, and none of these charges would be challenged by anyone. He also reminded me that I had no one to stand on my side or to shield or defend me against such evil plots. I listened carefully to him, but I decided to accept the invitation because the refusal would indicate weakness and fear, which are not worthy attributes for the followers of this great faith. I was reassured by remembering parts of the tablets revealed by Baha'u'llah in my honor. In them, he exhorted me to remember his exile, imprisonment, and hardship, and to follow in his footsteps on the path of salvation. The believers should accept calamities and never be despondent in the face of persecution, but trust their Lord and remain happy, joyous, and steadfast as a mountain. As I recall the statements in my own tablets, I became sure that imprisonment awaited me. Nevertheless, I went to the house of the consul at the appointed hour, along with Mirza Hussein Shirazi and Darvish Hassan. At first, we behaved like as Muslims, observing all the outward customs of Islam, but when the time came for the evening prayer, we demurred saying congregational prayer is forbidden except for the dead. This led to discussion of the faith and we spent the whole evening discussing the proofs of this revelation. We even recited one of the tablets of Baha'u'llah and related the suffering of the heroes and martyrs of the faith. The council appeared to be impressed and even convinced. Dawn was approaching when the consul retired, one of the servants came to convey our host's message that we should go home. This message was astounded us because at first the consul had treated us very kindly, but now at the hour of our departure, he rudely ordered us out of his house, not even having the manners to take leave of his guest. We left his house with a sense of foreboding. The consul had sent some people to carry lamps ahead of us to light the way through the dark and narrow lanes of the town. As we were tre treading the path towards my home, I discovered that every few steps, more men joined our company. As I was thinking over this strange situation, 
we suddenly found ourselves surrounded by at least 40 people who were indeed as devouring wolves. We were dragged to the prison where they robbed us of our clothing and placed all of us in chains and fetters, beating us with whatever was in their hands and cursing in the most horrible way. This continued until morning when they closed the doors of the prison and went away. I was content, but my companions were rather despondent. I did what I could to raise their spirits. The prison door remained closed to us the whole day. In the evening, it opened, and we were allowed to go out for food and to say our prayers. At this time, we learned that they had gone to my room and stolen all my possessions, clothes, books, works of calligraphy, and other precious articles. They gave me some old clothes, and when I said that the clothes did not belong to me, they became wild once again and began to torment us even more than before. Finally, they gave us a paper to sign. It was a receipt they had written explaining that, except for our books, all our belongings had been returned to us. We were forced to sign and seal this false document. They particularly mentioned the names of certain books and tablets because they planned to show the receipt to the Egyptian authorities and tell them that we were in possession of strange and dangerous writings. They grudged no effort to invent all sorts of false reports against us for submission to the Egyptian rulers, and the poisonous lander reached the members of the court. They represented themselves as the most sincere friends and were wishers of the Khedive, as a ruler in Egypt under the Turks, and stated that they were in fact protecting the Egyptians from the onslaught of the Babis. They reported that the Babis had made an attempt on the life of the Shah of Iran, and having failed there, he had dared to come to Egypt. The sovereign and the citizenry must be protected against such people, they argued, as they are sure to have friends and collaborators amongst the people of Egypt, Turkey, and Iran. The Khedive, who, was no, who had no son to succeed him, became very fearful, as it, it was natural for him to be so under the circumstances. Unfortunately, we were not in a position to defend ourselves against these false accusations. We tried to explain that we were Baha'is and not Babis, and the Baha'is are loyal and obedient to their government. But we were not even, given, not even allowed to open our mouths to utter a word in our own defense. For more than 50 years during the reign of Nasir al-Din Shah, the courtiers and officials of his government in Egypt had nothing better to do than to make false reports against us to the sovereign. They even untruthfully told him that they had discovered cash of arms and equipment in the houses of the Babis. A night came when I was taken to the consul's chambers the consul and an Egyptian officer were seated and a group of jailers stood by. I observed that also that there was a large group of people in chains. The consul suddenly became furious and pointing his finger at me, shouted, all the trouble has been caused by this man, their Gabriel and their prophet. No sooner were these words uttered that some man came and seized me, tied my hand behind my back and put a chain around my neck. This accusation had the desired effect on the Khedive of Egypt we immediately ordered the consul to arrest anyone belonging to this religion. It did not take the consul long to arrest some 300 people. We learned that he even arrested a few Egyptian subjects. Haji Abu Qasim was arrested, and when they brought the chain to be placed on his neck, he picked it up, kissed it, and putting it around his neck, uttered the words, Bismillah al al Abha, in the name of God the Glorious the glory of the all glorious. The consul, under the pretext of persecuting the Babis, had planned to collect large sums of money in bribes. My cell in the consulate was adjacent to a large room where these 300 people were imprisoned, Jews and Christians and Muslims. In order to free themselves from the tortures of imprisonment, these victims had to offer him money. Thus, an increasing flow of income found his way into the pocket of the consul. Each prisoner who was to be freed had to come to my cell, curse me, spit in my face, 
beat me and abuse all of the holy ones of our faith. This action would be taken as proof that the prisoner had not been or was no longer a babi, but as previously mentioned, they had to pay large sums of money as well. Some of these victims were ashamed and would not even look upon my face. Their tormentors forced them to look into my eyes and do whatever they were ordered to do. During the 45 days I spent in that jail, we suffered as in hell because of the council staff and servants. But my soul was in a state of the utmost joy had it not been for this sense of inner tranquility and composure, I could never have endured the savage acts, profane oaths, and the blasphemous remarks of these people. I was very happy in prison. The only exception was in the early hours of the day when the cruel persecutors would come to our room to beat, curse, and abuse us. This was the worst part of our daily life in prison. One night, the consul had invited some of the Persian dignitaries and some people from the Egyptian aristocracy to his home. The consul ordered that I should be taken in chains to the banquet. When I entered, it reminded me of the captivity of the Imam Hussein's family and their arrivals at the great gathering in the house of the governor of Kufi. Because before the council could speak, I sat down and addressed him saying, throughout the history of all religions, the chosen ones of God have been persecuted, chained, and forced to endure great hardships. It is a well-known saying that calamities are for the friends of God and those who deny him always follow the path of cruelty and injustice. Please ask all these people who are gathered here tonight what we have done that you must be subjected to such humiliation and injustice. Remember the exhortation of the Quran, which states that even if an evildoer brings you a message, it is your duty to investigate what religion sanctions the type of treatment we have received from you. <coughs> you only listen to those who accuse and never give us the victims an opportunity to open their mouths and explain their case. I spoke with such strength and authority that the consul ordered the jailers to take me back to my cell. One time a group of Persians arrived who were on their way to Mecca to show them how strong a person he was and how he protected and served his religion and country. The consul brought all the pilgrims to my prison cell. The moment he entered, he began to beat me with his cane. Then he said, Tell the truth, what is your name? Haidar Ali, I said. No, he protest protested. You have other names. You have been called the Gabriel of the Babis, the Amanuensis, and the first Imam. I have never said this, I responded. Someone has accused me of these things. Yes, he said. Well, his name must be Satan. I immediately replied because anyone who carries false reports and instigates people to act unjustly is none other than Satan. He always comes to people in such a way that they would know, not know him. He hit me again and said, are you so presumptuous as to vilify the ambassador himself? They went out and brought back a man who accused me of theft. theft. He demanded that I return to him the belongings of his brother. When he mentioned the name of his brother, I said that I did not know him. While we were arguing, all the others went out, leaving only the man and myself. No sooner were we alone than he embraced me and kissed me saying, I am Abdullah from Najafabad. I was in his presence. Now I am in Egypt on my way to Mecca. I heard about your imprisonment, knowing that they have confiscated all your belongings. I had lit a little money and thought to bring it to you. He gave me the money and continued. I couldn't come to the prison to meet you unless I had, had some excuse. Therefore, I told the consul that his prisoner had the belongings of my brother. Now, whatever happens, I will be most grateful if even if he keeps me here with, with you in this prison cell, if he allows me to go, I will also be grateful to my Lord. This same Abdullah made his way to Jiddi in uh, Saudi Arabia, where he met Haji Mirza Safa. There he became the servant 
of this mystic leader, some of the Persian knew Abdullah and were extremely surprised that the man who was a religious leader had employed such a well-known Babi as his close and trusted servant. The following conversation took place between Mirza Safa and Abdullah. I heard that you have been to Adrianople. Should I have any shortcomings or show any disloyalty in my services to you, you have every right to consider me a sinner and worthy of chastisement. But you have not employed you have not employed me, employed my conscience. Yes, it is true that I had the honor of making pilgrimage to his presence in Adrianople. What did you see there? All that I had heard about the past religions and the prophets of God, I beheld in him and in his manifestation. How is it that you saw such signs while the learned, the philosophers and the mystic leaders have not seen such things? It was the same in the days of the prophet Muhammad, the learned orators and philosophers denied him, but the illiterate, the peddlers and the slaves embraced his faith. Bravo, you answer well. After saying this, he gave Abdullah the, his wages and some extra money and recommending the, to him that he go from Jiddi to Egypt rather than to the resting place of the prophet in the city of Medina. Abdullah thought things over and said to himself, I have endured hardships and now I am here where the feet of the prophet Muhammad have trodden and where I can behold the sights seen by his own eyes. Why should I deprive myself of all these bounties? He was then determined to experience the full pilgrimage and in Medina, he once again met Mr. Safa remonstrated. I told you to go to Egypt and not to come to Medina. To pay homage to the shrine of the Prophet Muhammad is an act of worship and more important than obedience to you, Abdullah responded. I want you to be in my employment again. You are an honest person, but at the same time, I would like to give you some advice. Wise men never tread those paths on which they are perpetually confronted with many hardships or on such roads where they are constantly faced with danger. They choose the highways that are well kept and secure and along which are located many villages and towns. The path you have chosen for yourself will become in time a wonderful highway, but only after 200 years or so. Now there are many dangers on it. You must avoid them. It is absolutely true, but you must know that people like me must travel these dangerous roads and undergo difficulties and deprivation to pave the way for people like you. How is it that you are so quick to answer and are so brave and daring in your response, said Mirza Safa. In the Quran, the Prophet Muhammad has clearly said that those who long for death are always truthful. In order to tell the truth, no one requires meditation or careful thought, nor is the truthful man hesitant. A group of us were entrusted to the Egyptian officers to be taken to an unknown destination. When the people heard us reciting these joyous poems as a sign of faith and steadfastness, some burst into tears and others into laughter. We were conducted to another prison where the chains were taken from our wrists and next, and uh, we spent the night there. The next morning, our fellow prisoners asked us what charges had been brought against us. We said that we did not know what the Persian consul had accused us of. Have you killed anyone, they asked. This prison is only for murderers and assassins. We were not accused of murder. However, the charges against us were that we had abandoned Islam and created a new religion. So the next day I was able to, I was able to write a petition in Arabic to the Egyptian officer in charge of the prison. It did in it I argued the most basic principles of justice require that one should serve the sentence for the crime for which he is accused. The Persian consul, because of his personal animosity toward us, has accused us of establishing a new religion and discarding the laws of Islam. Yet we are in a prison for murderers. Not everyone can be accused of establishing a new religion. Anyone so accused must be at least must at least be learned and resourceful and respected by many people. To imprison us with murderers is most unjust. The officer, fearing that we might lead the other prisoners astray, decided to move us to separate quarters. Our new room had carpets and a few other comforts, but the other prisoners were not allowed to speak to us. A few days later, the consul came to the prison and saw our new quarters. 
we knew that from then on the conditions would be altered for the worst, and it was true. Eight nights passed. On the ninth, shortly after midnight, when all were asleep, soldiers came to our cell, again tied our hands behind our backs and chained us all in one row. My hands were so tightly bound and so severely damaged that I felt the effects of those ropes for the rest of my life. 50 soldiers were well armed and well equipped, took us on a stony road covered with thorns and thistles. Being ill and not sufficiently fed, we found walking very painful. As we were going down the road, the soldiers fell into conversation with us. Gradually, they realized that we are not violent prisoners and could not be any match for 50 soldiers. They asked us what we had done, and we told them the truth. They began to feel pity for us. My hands were swollen and caused me much pain. First, they released my hands, and then they became so kind and gentle that they even allowed us to ride horses in turn. When we approached the famous prison of Famul Bahr, I don't know where Famul Bahr is, but Bahr in Arabic means the sea. So anyway, it must be by the sea. The soldiers again put us all in chains. They kept us outside the town and sent word to the governor who specified our prison cell and ordered that we must be manacled together on one chain. He also emphasized that the prison cell must be dark and the door should be bolted and locked. A hole was made in the door of our cell. The chain was stretched through this hole and was held firmly in the hands of the guards outside. The day was almost as dark as the night and when evening came, no one gave us so much as a candle. We decided to chant the tablet of Naqus, which had been revealed by Baha'u'llah for the celebration of the night on which the Bab had declared his mission. Maybe later we'll eventually find it for next time and see what is this tablet of Naqus, which had been revealed by Baha'u'llah for the celebration of the night on which the Bab had declared his mission. We were eight prisoners and our voices united in chanting the verses. When we soldiers heard this, they came in, in with a lamp for us. They thought that we were dervishes and that we were chanting something which contained the mention of God. This attracted their kindness toward us. Thereafter, the soldiers kept the doors of our cell open during the day and unchained us all. Now, the theme is confinement. So I want you to understand what confinement means. What's the name this of the tablet? I have to write this it down. Confi no. Confinement. I'm talking about confinement. Now you're talking oh. about Nakut. Naqus, N-A-Q-U-S, Violeta. Yeah, ask uh, whatever, Adi, Naqus. I'm sure we know it, but we just don't know it as tablet of Naqus. Cool. This is a um, confinement in the 1880s or 1870s in Egypt. And, and they're going to go further than Egypt. They're really going south. So it was not long before officers, notables, merchants, and people of each and every class among the inhabitants of that area demonstrated the longing to be in our company and enter into discussion with us. Without exception, these people showed us love and compassion. Some of them were indeed of noble nature. They did everything in their power to make us happy by their sincere love and often by their gifts. Some went so far as to ask us to give them the text of special prayers for the fulfillment of their wishes and the solution of their difficulties. During the 50 days of our imprisonment, I was busy writing prayers, including verses that proclaim the advent of the Baba and Baha'u'llah. These 50 days enabled us to regain our energy, health and strength. Every minute of those days, we were far from the material world and very close to our beloved because of the tablets and prayers that we chanted. We're even ready to be martyred in this path. It would be better to be martyred here, we thought, than in the house of the Persian consul. In those days, because of the many cruelties we had suffered, our blood was thin and weak. After 50 days of rest and proper food, we felt that we had more and better blood to offer. But all these were wishful thoughts, for the night arrived when the soldiers came to take us back to Egypt. The, the soldiers proved to be very kind indeed. They did not cause us difficulties, nor did they torture us on the way back. 
On the contrary, they allowed us to ride on camels, horses, and whatever was available. They also stopped at two or three stations to have coffee and tea and allow us to rest before continuing our journey. When we approached the town, we were again put in chains, but the kind-hearted soldiers apologized by saying, we're under strict orders, then we have to surrender you to the authorities in chains. We were then taken to the first place to which we had been sent in our exile. The officers told us, you are brought here for investigation. But after six days, we were again sent to the former prison in the same chains and along with the same guards and officers. We reached our prison, and on the 16th day, the soldiers took us to ironsmiths and carpenters in order to place permanent fetters on our feet and chains around our necks. This process proved to be more painful than anything which we had previously endured. We could not control ourselves and cried out in pain. The soldiers, blacksmiths and carpenters wept on our, at our plight this was particularly true of the blacksmiths and carpenters who cursed their professions for making these instruments, for making them instruments for the torture of innocent people. The last operation was to put our hands in stocks. The heavy fetters on our feet, the terrible chains on our necks and hands made very little movement, made every little movement a torture, a torment. We could not move our hands much, nor was it possible for us to lift the chains on our feet in order to make their weight less painful while walking. The fashioning of the chains and the stocks began about two o'clock in the afternoon and was finished a little after sunset. Then they took us to a steamer and delivered us to a group of a hundred officers and soldiers. We began to understand the evil instigations of the consul. He had so terribly frightened the Egyptian government that the boat carrying us, refused to accept commercial goods, lest the people should come to the ports, see our plight, and discuss the inhuman manner of our treatment. Whenever the boat drew near the shore and dropped anchor, we were immediately pushed into a storeroom, the windows of which were firmly shut. During our, ca during our captivity, our clothes have never had never been changed. We had worn them for months and uh, they became so torn and dirty that they were intolerable. Now that we were chained, we could not even take them off to wash them. Gradually, God inspired the hearts of the guards and soldiers, and they took a liking to us. Out of pity, they prepared us long white garments. They had to tear the clothes off our bodies. Then they washed us with hot water and clothed us with the new long robes. We felt so happy that we thought it was New Year's Day and we were wearing clothes for the first festivities. We discovered that these soldiers had been told that this humble servant could control spirits and influence invisible creatures. Therefore, they approached me and asked me to give them amulets to protect them against the operating operations of the spirits called jinn, which they believed lived underground. I knew that the amulets, which they were accustomed to contain the names of angels and numerological formulas, so I wrote some tablets for them in which I used the greatest name and the anagrams for the names of Baha'i friends. Sometimes I would add the names of the gifts which were brought to us, such as cheese, tobacco, bread, shirts, and tea. I write this particularly to show the reader that we were joyful and content in our imprisonment. Jafar Pasha, this was a good guy. The governor general of the Sudan came on board of the ship. He sent for me and I was taken to his presence. I asked him, what are the charges against us? May God punish your consul, was his reply. He has created such fear in the hearts of the government officials that all are afraid of you. He has accused you of changing your religion, your book, and the holy laws of Islam. He says that you were a terrorist that you intend to assassinate the heads of government, but it is obvious that you are people of the past and that you do not meddle in politics. He told us that he would see to it that we were made as comfortable as possible. However, we remained in that spot only three days. On the third day, the guards were changed and new ones came with camels for us to ride, but chained together as we were our feet in one stock and our wrist joined by chains. How could we ride on camels? 
the guards were at a loss for what to do and how to carry us to our next destination. Eventually, they brought some long pieces of strong white cloth. They placed the hands and feet of each pair of us on the saddle, one person hanging on one side of the camel and the other on the other side. Then they tied our hanging bodies to the camels with the white cloth. A more torturous way to travel cannot be imagined. Five or six times during the short journey, they made the camels kneel down and we were untied and permitted to have a little rest. The guards apologized to us, saying that previously they had taken a group of thieves and murderers to the Sudan in chains, but that these others had to walk all the way through the desert. Jafar Pasha had instructed them to allow us to ride, and they could not think of any other way. Although we were in great pain and torture, as we watched each other hanging from the camels, the sight was so ridiculous that we could not help laughing. In five or six hours, we reached the banks of the Nile River, where we were again sent to a ship. We boarded and set off. The ship deposited us at a place that was under the control of a very kind-hearted Arab sheikh. We explained our situation to him and asked him to treat us with more mercy. We still had a long stretch of desert to co cover by camel. When the sheikh learned of our plight, he ordered the camel drivers to have wooden seats provided for us on the camels and to carry enough food for all of us. The sheikh was well experienced and knew how severe the desert journey would be. We had to travel 12 days over an ocean of sand. In place of Egyptian guards, we were entrusted now to Arabs who were cruel hearted, devoid of manners and very hot tempered. The moment, the moment we were in their hands, they made it clear to us that they possessed the power of life or death. No matter what they did, no one was to complain or utter a word. The Sheikh had supplied them with enough provisions for all but these people only gave us enough for one person and consumed the rest themselves. Their treatment called to mind the hardships we had endured in the house of the consul in Egypt. Still, we remained happy and could always find something to laugh at. We made jokes about our guards in Persian and would laugh heartily. When we finally reached the Sudan, we thanked God that we were alive. So, as you can see, uh, kind of skip a little bit here. It's, it, it, it gets worse. You know, they are in Sudan, they arrived in Khartoum. And uh, um, there were some good periods because they had some good governors that helped them. And they were able to. Um, their life improved a little bit, and you will see what happened. So I'm going to skip a lot of the the tortures because it lasted many years. So we're not going to go to every single period. But in the skipping in the book, a few pages, uh, he says after relating all this continuous imprisonment in, in in Sudan, it was in the seventh or eighth year of our imprisonment. Okay, so this is seven, eight years, right? Long time. So in the, it was in the seventh or eighth year of our imprisonment in the Sudan that Haji Ali al Yazdi, accompanied by his brothers, came to visit us as instructed by Baha'u'llah. So Baha'u'llah knew that where they were. This bounty of God was indeed overwhelming, but by this time we were financially well settled. So things had improved for them. They got more settled in the, in the city. What we needed was the breeze of the merciful wafting over us from the rose garden of his love this was granted to us by the coming of these friends who brought fresh news from the Holy Land. We suggested that one of them should stay in Khartoum to open and manage a commercial center. Haji Ali accepted the proposal and he smiled and he himself became the head of this trading operation. The next year I was in charge of this business, which in the course of time became very famous as the means by which many came to know about the faith and its followers. Once or twice a year, someone would visit us from the Holy Land in the course of business. They would 
also bring the spiritual sustenance and keep us alive. We thank God a thousand times that we have been favored with the knowledge of this revelation. So this is like, now it looks like they were pioneers. It's like they went through eight years of hell and basically now they're settled in Khartoum. Um, so, you know, comes this general now, General, uh, what's his name? General Gordon. Sorry. General Gordon became the governor of the Sudan and then sort of he started. This is all the British were there and the Turks are there. And this, this, this is 19th century towards the end. This is all the time of Baha'u'llah. So he asked him, he says, we are here, so you should write a petition, you know, and just to be freed. So, so he wrote a petition to ask for freedom. So, and explain why you're in prison without any investigation. So he wrote the, uh, they dispatched that uh, uh, a letter to the general and the cable was handed stating that we were free to return home, but we were not allowed to go to Egypt. The day of departure was indeed a great spectacle. All of the notables, Christians and Muslims came to bid farewell and see us safely on board the ship bound for freedom. After our departure, we learned that the Consul General of Iran, Mirza Hussein Khan, who had committed so many iniquities and had been the cause of our imprisonment, eventually became the subject of the hatred of his own compatriots. The incessant plots he contrived against others for the purpose of depriving them of their possessions and money caused many oppressed individuals to lodge complaints against him to the Persian court. Officers investigated and soon his plans, plunders, and persecutions became known. First, he was stripped of all the wealth he had so dishonestly, dishonestly gathered from Persian subjects. Then he was put in chains and dispatched to Persia. So he was punished for his evil deeds. That was the story of this consul. And uh, so now he's, he leaves. He's free to go. But he cannot stop in Egypt. So my boat was bounded for Jiddah in Saudi Arabia, the well-known Arabian port where thousands of pilgrims gathered to approach Mecca and Medina. Um, in Mecca, a great surprise awaited me upon my arrival. I had the immense joy and honor of meeting two Baha'is, Salman, the messenger of the merciful, and Haji Muhammad Yazdi. After spending two months in quarantine, we left Mecca, crossing the tempestuous sea. We saw at every moment the wings of death spread over us. After losing all hope of arri arriving anywhere, we finally reached Beirut. In the city, we had the honor of meeting Muhammad Mustafa Baghdadi, who was one of the most distinguished followers of the faith. Um, and his sons, Hussein, Ali, and Dia, carried this essence of their father. They all stood as members of one body to serve the cause of God and the people of Baha'u'llah. It was in their house that I wrote supplication to Baha'u'llah in the Holy Land. At the top of my letter, I wrote a verse of the Quran, which reads, praise be the Lord who has fulfilled his promise and granted us the earth as our inheritance and to live in paradise as we wish. But in the letter, I changed as we wish to as thou desirest. When my letter reached his merciful hands, he immediately said, we have invited him long ago. He is permitted to come. And this, this ends the forced uh, confinement and imprisonment of Haji Mirza Haidar Ali I had to cut all this lot of nonsense that he went through because you know you can't you know i mean you have people that were martyred and it's awful and then you have people that were imprisoned and tortured but bahala promised him that he was going to to come back you're going to, you're going to see him again so now we leave him after returning to he is on his way to reach Akka now. Mm -hmm. So maybe next week, God willing, we'll try to conclude this chapter on Haider Ali and pick up some of the wisdom, some of the things that happened this time after he returned from, from his imprisonment 
in the Holy Land because, as you know, he lived very, you know, very old age. And Abdul Baha would not let him go at one point. He stayed with him. So, you know, some of our, our ancestors, you know, went through, went through hell, basically. Let's hope that that, that suffering, you know, does not, does not come to us. But again, there's, there's, there's obviously a wisdom in all this thing, you know, otherwise they would, you know, I mean, this is, it starts with the, with the Christ, early Christians and, and, and believers are tested and sometimes it is that price. It's not always martyrs, martyrdom, but sometimes it's imprisonment and you have to stand firm and, you know, some stand firm and some don't. That's basically the story, you know. The, the, you know, the, the faith is built on, on these people, on these acts. And it, it, it's good to know because, uh, I mean, I'm sorry if it would be a bit long to tell the details, but I mean, this, this man spent his life, you know, he spent all these years, just one day in that lousy prison. I don't think any of us would even like to even set foot in that prison. But, you know, and it makes us, first of all, appreciate and, and love the man because, uh, you know, knowing quickly the story of somebody he says, wait, he spent 80, eight years in prison. And if we just said, yeah, 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 he spent eight years in Sudan in prison, that's one thing. But if you start telling some of the details that he went through, you can almost relive that pain with him. You know, I mean, it's my God, you can just living in, and Bahá'u'lláh went through, you know, four months in Siachal. It's hard to imagine one day, a full day of Bahá'u'lláh in the Siachal tied down. He can move with chains, you know, 25 kilos on the neck. And I mean, we don't, but yet Baha'u'llah keeps telling us, remember what happened to me, see? And we have to find ways of remembering, you know, how do you remember things? I mean, nobody wants to remember anguish because it's painful. So you obviously don't, you, you just mention it. Remember that famous quotation that you you printed in utterances, Villeta? about, uh, 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 how does it start? O ye beloved of God, the one that says, repose not yourselves in your couches and bestir yourselves as soon as you recognize your Lord, the creator, here are the things that have befallen him and here are the things that have befallen him. So why does he say that? <laughs> because you have to know, because if you don't know, why would you, you know, then you don't appreciate why you have to get up and, and spread the cause because because the, this faith is actually, it's a cause. You know, this is funny about, the, we say Christianity and Islam, right? We say Baha'i faith, and we say it's a cause. You know, Baha'u'llah speaks of, of a world order. He speaks of world system, the world it has seen. It's like a project. I mean, at the same time, it's a religion. At the same time, it's, it's, a, it's a project. You know, the project is to create, build, you're trying to build a system, a world system where nobody is left out. And that's what Jesus promised. So all we are doing is we are doing what was promised aforetime, you know, that's what we're doing. We're in this project and it's a building project. The building, you know, and you know, and, and, and the image of the building is the, what, what we, when we see the beauty, the houses of worship in this world. Okay? Even John is, 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 is behind the one in Santiago. So those houses of worship, and the more you see them, and the more beautiful you see them, that is the image. That is what the beauty of the system is. It, is, it, is, it can be seen in buildings. So it's the architecture that reflects. Look at the Holy Land. Look at the, what they're building for, for Abdul Baha. Look at the gardens. Look at the terraces. Look at everything that this faith has done the time of Shoki Effendi, how important beauty was. And so the houses of worship are the example of what it is that Baha'is can do. Now, the idea is that our faith should not be just about buildings. Because people need to look at buildings, but people don't, can't live off buildings. They want to see communities. So that's the trick that, you know, people will appreciate suffering of, of of Haidar Ali and the imprisonment and people that make it through these years without recanting their faith. But they also want to see live communities of people of diverse races that all young, different economic strata and live together and enjoy themselves that there's no hangups and everybody's fine. And they see that 
Then they say, that's what I want. See, that's how many people become Baha'is because they see. Of course, temples is not enough to become a Baha'i. Uh, writings, maybe not enough. They want to see live stuff, live, like a, like a live concert. You want to go see that. So, so that's the challenge we have, you know? And of course, this we all build, we build together. No, perhaps, yeah, go ahead, John. Uh, perhaps, you know, uh, in the early years, the Baha'i uh, the faith, you know, uh, the believers paid the price with uh, persecution and, and gave, you know, unimaginable suffering as the price to be paid for the faith. And, and these days, the believers, you know, they have to kind of pay with the price of service and self-sacrifice and, and working towards the vision and the, uh, you know, laid out before by Allah. And it's just a, um, it's coming, coming up broken, John. I don't know what's the, the mic. Is the mic. Oh, uh, just as uh, oh, you know, oh, yes, the, yes. They, they suffered unimaginable sufferings back then. I mean, yes. we have a small price to pay by you know, paying, uh, not paying, but uh, but through our service, we could uh, uh, uh achieve the vision of um, you know, God and the age of maturity that uh, Baha'u'llah. Uh, talked about. Yeah. Yeah. It seems to be a small price to pay, but I think that's what that's what kind of gripped me when I first came in contact with the faith is this urgency, a sense of urgency that you know we have to go into action, you know, and uh, correct. Right. Right. Yes. Yes. Because world community is not going to be built just because we believe in it. it it's got to be actually created, like you said. It, 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 it requires a tremendous amount of work and self-sacrifice, I think. And, and, and it, grows, it grows organically. I mean, you know, we can't, it has ups and downs. You know, this is what, you know, we all have to remember. You know, you can't expect, uh, Baha'u'llah has been, you know, the faith has been around for 150 years. And yet you can go to some cities and there is, uh, in some cases, and there's barely an assembly. So what are you going to do? You know, but I mean, when Baha'u'llah was alive, Baha'u'llah wrote to the kings. You know, nobody responded. So, so how do you handle that? You know, it's just because uh, the way things evolve, the way things go, and they, they go up and down. Sometimes you have to go through crisis. Sometimes you have uh, you know brilliant communities and then something happens and you know fizzles out but again i think that uh, it's it's each one's commitment to to do his part you have to you have to basically leave your mark you know you have to do whatever you do you know, not everybody is gonna is gonna be handled the cause of god we're not gonna be like uh, uh, Dr. Mohajer, you know, who basically spent all his life going around the world with speaking every five seconds to the whole world and reaching millions and millions. I mean, you know, it'd be nice, but I mean, we can't all be doing that, you know, obviously. You know. Uh, so each one has something, some role to play, and all different. And each one has to just make sure you leave your mark. And, uh, and that's the beauty of it. And I think that by, by learning what others are doing, uh, we maybe get inspired and we, we appreciate what others are doing and you want to be learn from him learn from this learn from the other one and um, you know uh, uh, finally just, just to come back to we are coming to teaching you know uh, today is the first day that I, we, I, I held a fireside in my home in our home that I had suspended since uh, March because we because that was the lockdown and COVID and all that, and last March. And of course, we were in a school and uh, we had to leave the place and we had to destroy all our buildings and leave. And so since that day, um, uh, since that day, we, uh, we just did not, I did not hold this gathering at home, which was basically, it's what they call, I call a prayer meeting, but you know, I sort of like, I cheat, I consider it, a place to pray. We pray a little bit. Then we have, like maybe read the tablet, and so you comment on what Baha'u'llah said that is not a prayer. 
and then you sneak in and you do a fireside, you know, because it's some number high scum. So if you combine the three things together. So, and, and one reason I had suspended it deep down is because one of the most faithful attendees who was uh, my driver, who had a taxi and became, uh, who just passed away a few days ago, uh, was, was not sincere. You know, he was, he acted like he was a believer but he was doing other stuff. He was in his foot was, was in all kinds of other stuff, uh, you know. And so it was like, a, you know, kind of stabbed me, you know, in a way because he acted like an angel, you know, and but he was doing all other stuff outside that had nothing to do with the faith in other occult movements, and and that's what he was actually teaching other people. So anyway, so that hits you to the point you say, my God, am I like doing things that are a waste of time? Like I'm, you know, what I'm saying. You know, I'm wasting, like I, like I have no success. But it's not, you can't look at it this way because, you know, the other people that came that have accepted the faith of believers. And, and you cannot guarantee what the people that you teach will become, will do. There's no way on this earth, you know, that's responsible. So once I got over that, I finally managed to, to bring some of my teachers that are Baha'is at school. They became Baha'is in the course of the, of the last few years. And I brought... Um, uh, then two non Baha'is came. One of them is a new, is the one I've been mentioning before called Toto. He's a French, French teacher. He teaches French, yeah. And he's been reading the books and he always likes to take notes. He comes with questions. He says, um, I write, he has a notebook and he writes the questions. And he's very methodic. It's very, very seldom do you have people coming to your fireside with a notebook and having written notes. But interesting, you encourage it. So he asked me questions about, he wanted to know, uh, why? Who was? Yeah, Abdul Baha. He didn't know what Abdul. He, said, he kept reading Abdul Baha. He had no idea. He said, "Was he the spiritual son of Baha?" I said, "No, no, no. This is his son." Oh, okay. Son, okay. Because I, see, I haven't seen. I see many Abdul Baha writings, but I don't see Baha. So where, where are the writings? So I had to pick up a book that we published in Africa that is an excerpt of uh, Baha Baha'u'llah's writings, but it's you know, okay, smaller. Listen, these are his words, so he, could, so he was happy to have them, so he left with that. He wanted to know about persecution. Uh, no, is this, he, asked, he asked about... Uh, yeah, he wanted to know, what are these laws? So I had to somehow, trying to get, trying to explain that in this faith we have, we have advice, like a counsel, Baha'u'llah like gives counsels, admonitions, things that are good, principles, and then you have laws. You know, and like different things. And of course, you know, so explain the different categories of things. So you get, because you, you, we always imagine that people that they talk to you, they really have a grasp of this faith. And they, sometimes they don't, you know, so you've got to find ways of making them understand it. That, that, and then Baha'u'llah is, you know, unique laws. I mean, you don't have laws, you don't have book of laws anywhere in the world. So he appreciated that. And he wanted to know more about, I guess, uh, uh, the history of the faith. But anyway, so it's nice to have people that are, you know, so... But I had to invite him, you see, because uh, if you don't invite people, also they don't come to you. See, so you always are, you're afraid to invite because if I invite, what's he going to say? Is he going to come? You know, so I teased him. I said, listen, you haven't talked to me in months, you know, I've been gone and you haven't said, you never even wrote me a word. It is, you, you're writing a thesis on a, on a French poet and you don't write me anything. So I, I teased him and I said, ah, I'm coming, I'm coming. Anyway, so you can. So that's what you should all do, you know, as much as we can is, is try to seize opportunities, you know, because you don't want one day people to blame you for not mentioning the faith to them because, because you know, you don't want that. One day, maybe you say, my God, John, you knew about this and what, you think that I'm, I cannot understand this? Why well, you think this is too, you know, I mean, I'm just kidding, but you know, you never know. People are funny in the way they react and so you don't want to. And that's what Baha'u'llah says, you have to speak unceasingly. He's cool, you know.